connects with what, for what reason. And with local log, you have a scope which you can see and identify um, what is protected what. And the remaining users are most, uh, mostly used to um, assert per CPU variables or hardware registers, at which point it's mostly totally fine uh, to, uh, to have it as is. Um, so with all this, we ended up with um, log ordering. There is um, a document in the current with um,
So looking at print K, print K does mostly three things. The first thing is it looks at the format string and puts it then in the ring buffer. That's like the first step. And once that, and once that happened, um, it goes via all the console drivers and invokes the print K routine. So here we could think, do we go for a ROS bin lock there or do we do something else? Um, if you look at the times that the, that the UART may spend at 11,000 baud rate, then we get roughly 86 microseconds for a single character to get through. And if we intend to print 20 characters, we end up with one and a half millisecond where the interrupts are disabled. And from our T point of view, this is way too much. We have use cases where we try to get below 100 microseconds. So this is not working. Um, you could argue that we could disable printing for the normal things and go only for the warnings and errors to, to ensure they're always printed and then go for the ROS block T. However, if we make the change, everyone is using that. Even if you don't do console at all, you only use your UART for Bluetooth communication, for instance, then this will also disable interrupts for the Bluetooth communication. So this isn't helping at all. So for that reason, for our key point of view, we need to have a way to avoid disabling interrupts while things are printed on the console. And in the end for the 6.0 merge window, I suggested to exactly that to avoid printing. And this wasn't liked very much. So now we basically, yeah step back again and now we're actually waiting for print gate to be somehow tackled that we can print as well as from nmi or interrupt uh, non interruptible context as well from for everyone else without getting into high latencies um long latencies so this is that one example how to get there like we cannot schedule for one reason or another and then we may have a list with items that we work on. Like one example was the print K that one character takes 80 microseconds, 20 take over millisecond. Um, there can be also other things like um, long computations for each list item. There can be list items that maybe um, can sum up if you have a user and instead of queuing one or 10, it may go on and queue 100 or 5,000. Processing them all with disabled interrupts leads up to long latencies. Another thing are uh, contended locks with ROS pin locks. Basically, you have CPUs, uh, systems with a lot of CPUs like 64 and up, and all of them are spinning on the same lock. The lock will be handed over from one CPU to the other, and all that will increase latencies by the way that the last CPU has to wait the longest. It's still fair from that point of view, but waiting 50, 80, microseconds for the lock is just killing the system. Um, this is an example for clock nano sleep. Clock nano sleep is invoked um, for a task to sleep. And once the time is up, it, um, the task is woken up. In general, for skip ADA, like the, the, the normal task, which try to uh, shift them to soft LQ context, which is preemptible. But an RT task itself is woken up from um, hard angle context, which disabled interrupts and so on. Um, the first one um, wakes up 100 tasks, and this is an output from a cyclic test. So the important part is that the task itself runs at priority 95, is like very high in the system. And while waking up 100 tasks, we get a maximum latency of 26 microseconds. And since current is completely something else, it means that it the, the system didn't even notice it, that it this, uh, woke up 100 tasks uh, simultaneously. Um, if we go up for 500 tasks, we end up with 75 microseconds, at which point it becomes noticeable. So you see that something is odd. And if we go on with 5,000 tasks, we have 5,000 tasks, we end up with over four milliseconds, at which point um, it's killing it. And this is completely controlled from user land. So waking up tasks at the same time um, at the same time is actually not working for RT because all the wake-ups are performed at the same time. And this is basically what I meant with, you have a list item, you 
work on it with disabled interrupts and you go one by one, which is basically happening here. It wakes one task by one and 5,000 is basically killing it. Um, priority boosting, basically inheritance. It is um, one of the core things we need in RT that um, one task that has a lock can hand over the lock to the RT task, which has higher priority, and the handout box move in a way that the priority is handed over. And basically how it looks like is something like this. This is a compressed tracing output, where basically remove everything, so to make it fitting on the one slide. Um, so we have two tasks, like locking A and locking B. And locking A did acquire the lock, and then it woke up locking B, which is the other task. And task B, locking B was scheduled immediately on the CPU because it has the higher priority. And locking B requires the same lock as lock A is currently holding. And since it has the higher priority, it can never be running on a CPU again. And to avoid the situation of spin forever, we basically hand over the priority to the task with the lock, and then locking B leaves the CPU. Basically, so locking A can make progress as long as it has the lock, and then it can release the lock, so locking A can still make progress in a good way and do whatever it needs. So the sketch PI set prior is where you see that the priority has been handed over, and once the lock has been released, the priority is getting back to the origin task, and locking A remains running at the low priority again. And this is an important um, concept that we have, and we have it for most locks in the, in the kernel. Um, basically, everything that um, is based on RT mutex, the original implementation of it, and this is like most of the kernel that we have in it. The important part is that there is always one lock owner, and we have um, the owner recorded, so we can hand over the lock one way or another. Um, we have RVSEM, for instance, where it is not really working perfectly. The reason is that RVSEM can have multiple readers, and we cannot boost all of them to get them out for the writer. So the writer is always waiting for all the reader to get out. Um, from our key point of view, this doesn't matter much since the reader is usually that one, that task in the system that has the high priority. So the reader can um, hand over its priority to the writer and get it out of the critical section where it doesn't work the other way around. Um, same thing with RW log T. Um, most of the users are gone or transformed to RCU locking, where it's basically lockless. So from RT point of view, it doesn't matter much. Um, semaphores, for instance, don't work at all since they are completely anonymous. There is no owner. You can acquire the semaphore in one thread context and the release on the other. And since there is no owner tracking, nothing, you cannot do anything about it. Um, the MM semaphore is one of those um, that was offending in the past. But since we have no memory allocation for the RT thread, we are basically ask people to allocate memory uh, up front and lock the pages in memory with mlock, then it doesn't happen actually. With that, um, we can end up in a situation where one thread can still run while the other thread in the same task can still allocate memory. So this is basically working fine. Um, PI boosting can also be used from user land with the prior inherited mode. Right. Ah, so the context. Um, we had, since the early days of RT, several iterations of it, what to do, how to handle it. We had one way where we were locking one software queue against the other, and we basically were following networking because networking came other, always with other things how to break us. At which point later we decided to follow mainline principle of doing it. So basically we ended up with a big kernel lock, with a kernel lock per CPU, which is basically what SoftIQ does. Um, 
The problem is that NetTX of LQ and Taslet, for instance, are completely unrelated. Like NetTX of LQ is doing networking processing, while Taslet can be some work offloaded from an SATA driver. Like completely different department. Um, however, they can still be related. Like NetTX and RX can share the same CPU variables. And networking sometimes expects that the timer isn't running on the same CPU. And for that reason, we have to follow up with it. And the problem we have is that if you have, for instance, large networking processing with um, Ethernet driver, which, before, which does downloading, sending packets over it, and then you have a CAN driver which tries to send only one tiny packet, that driver has to wait for the soft IQ to become available, at which point it means it has to flush all the way and wait for the um, networking to be done. So PI and everything from priority boosting is working, but it still takes time to wait until it's, um, until it's finished its work, which is kind of breaking things if you want to have low latency. The way we tackle it right now is that we try to offload things. We have like the high throughput for networking like on one CPU and the dedicated CAN with the low latency is running on other CPU. But it's not ideal that uh, what we do right now. Um, another thing is the part that we dispatch work for later. This was very common in the early days where we didn't have threaded interrupts. So basically, the interrupt handler which was running with disabled interrupts had some work that it wanted to hand over later within to the tasklet where it can run again for longer periods of time with enabled interrupts and not affect the system as much. Um, a famous example is mostly the NAPI for networking, where the interrupt handler basically schedules the NAPI handler, which runs later in soft IRQ and basically uh, collects packets from networking card. Um, as mentioned er earlier, the more tasklets you get, the more work you have in some way and numerous context where we cannot um, hand over priorities, we cannot steer the work and say this is more important than that. So in general, the nice thing to do from our key point of view is to avoid tasklets and use the threaded interrupt for the work. It still has the same benefit mostly that it runs with enabled interrupts and can be visible and um, you can see where it's coming from. Where if you have a task list scheduled from the disk I.O., another one from, uh, from the video driver, like a webcam, you don't see which one is which. You basically see the task that you have a lot of soft actions going on in the system. Um, another way we see is like work use is basically the same mechanism where people hand over work that is not done yet. It's basically handed over to a cave worker. It's, we end up mostly in the same situation that we cannot track work. And a famous example is the TTY layer, where you do TTY communication, read and write. Um, we start in the interrupt handler, where we, and we can assign a priority and say, this is important, this is high priority. But then the TTY layer schedules a worker to complete the injections in the TTY buffer, at which point it adds up in the K worker, and, we don't, and it's basically anonymous. And the problem here is if you have an RT system and you want to have um, high priority um, console work, not maybe console, but maybe um, Bluetooth or the dedicated device on the other line of the TTY, um, then it basically breaks the thing. And there was discussion in the past how to fix it, and we never ended up with anything. I'm aware that a lot of people having their own hacks to avoid a Kai worker and have a dedicated thread for it. But using more worker from interrupt handler for dealing things with a, simple, a single device is not ideal. Um, it even hurts more the system if you hand over the worker to a dedicated CPU for no obvious reason. And the point is that if you're using RT with a dedicated CPU, um, you don't see where the work is going, and you maybe hurt the isolated CPU. Um, so with that, I'm getting to the end. Um, we're trying, um, we're basically trying to mention all the things that RT can be uh, broken with. Um, 
most famously the raw locking and the atomic context, which should be avoided if possible, if not needed. So we try to have it for, for the hardware to begin with and avoid it if not possible. Also the API that we have is very limited. Like memory location is not working, task waking is working as long as not, not the awake queue. Um, same with PM disable, be careful. All of that contributes to, to high latency if it's uh, taken for a long time. Um, spinning locks, which are high contended, especially on many CPUs, will raise the latency while all the CPUs try to get the lock independent. They spin with disabled interrupts or preemption and you cannot interrupt them at all. And for if you come up and you think you need to invent a new primitive for locking for data structure, whatever, keep in mind that you maybe need a synchronization for RT in, in case it's um, something like polling to complete, as I mentioned with the timer. You need to keep in mind that RT will preempt you and you need to tackle it. Um, keep in mind if you need boosting or not in case to make progress faster and soft LQs, be aware that currently we have a big kernel lock for it on a per CPU basis. And this ends up in not ideal workloads. Now, so with that, I'm coming to an end. Any questions? So, I guess, no, uh, I think you may have already gotten th th this feedback already, but um, so recently I was doing some stuff on P-Trace and some preempt RT patches came through and how do I put this? There used to be, and I think it really should still be, that preempt RT changes can't happen in mainline unless they're good for mainline, maintainable in mainline. Right. And um, I've seen a lot of preempt RT patches, maybe um, that, that seem to be, oh, we gotta do this or preempt RT doesn't work. And that's the justification. And it's not particularly good patches for mainline. Um, have, is I guess making this a question, have, have you heard that feedback? Have you, have you seen that happening? Yeah, a few times, yes. Okay, I just, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just want, want to give a little pushback because that was, yeah, it's still, you know, the P-Trace stuff still hasn't gotten sorted out and um, the patches I've seen suggested are still <laughs> not again, please. The, the P-Trace issues haven't been fully sorted out with preempt RT and the patches I've seen suggested are all hacks um, that are not good for maintenance of mainline. So just wanted to make certain people doing with, dealing with preempt RT are aware of that. Yeah, p is, I think, one of the examples where it's actually hard to get. Um, I am not aware how ideal the non-RT version of p is. And from RT point of view, it works mostly. And I think we ended up with a few hacks in the end. But mostly after we rewrite from I think the P-Trace maintenance is going to put it that way. Me. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, there's still, well, me and Oleg does more, but yeah, I kind of hook. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I did a lot of sorting out, but yeah, there's, yeah, P-Trace is a pain because it use, is one of the few cases in the kernel where you have to stop in the scheduler. So right. you can read all the process state re remotely. And, um, and that has a whole bunch of special rules. And um, you know, by, by, by preempting stuff, you were, you know, um, stuff was thought, anyway. Yeah. During spin locks and other stuff, you know, it gets a whole kind of, kind of all kinds of weird rule stuff. But, but, um, but not to be offending, yeah, yeah, no. um, 
P-Trace is kind of difficult to understand from people that are not been around for years to understand how it got where it is right now. Oh yeah. Um, so we never mean to throw patches at you and say, this is what we want and this has to go as in, right? So we basically often schedule an idea how we propose to do things and sometimes we're not happy with it either. Now, if people step in with more knowledge and say, this is what needs to be done, we need to rewrite this and that, it may take weeks, but this is what I want to see. In general, we are happy to follow up. Okay. Yeah. It, just, just, just the way it was presented was, um, you know, P-Trace is broken here, we got to do something. something exactly. It, it's a regression, something, you know, that kind of, that, that kind of language when it was fact doesn't even, it, it's never worked. It's always been broken. Right, and, exactly. And, and, and what needs to be done is find, find, dig in and find a good solution that's maintainable for everybody. Exactly. So networking or anything else where we are more familiar with, we come up with something that is closer where the maintainer doesn't shoot us down completely. And then they say, this is good, but please do it that and that, and then consider these cases as well. And then clean up and do whatever you want. So this is the way we've been working ever since. So okay. if you see us posting patches that are completely nuts, just say what you want. Okay. And we usually follow up. As I said, the different part with P-Trace is that we never understood what it tries to protect, how it works, and what is meant to work. Or oh, how, yeah. yeah. You know, so if you can clarify that and say what yeah. you want, yeah, I'll, usually we're happy to follow up. Yeah, and it just has, Peter has so much history, I'm not certain anybody um, ha ha has it in, the, in their head and you just have to read the code um, a lot. So, but yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. Right, right, I mean, after you rework, we went down from, I think, three or four Peter hex down to one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So thank you very much for that. Anyone? Yeah, can I? Go on. Um, I would like to point out uh, that the, the locking types documentation in the kernel uh, is up to date and fantastic because even though I'm doing this stuff all the time, I also sometimes forget uh, in this preemption models, bin locks or this or that, uh, just to throw it out there, the, the locking types documentation is fantastic with examples so that people can reference that. My question is your experience, because it's the, now the job of the maintainers of the subsystems to make sure, you know, when preempt RT is, is mainline, to kind of filter to make sure that we don't have this lock abuse or in, incorrect locking. I was just wondering what your experiences is for the maintainers. Are they following this or, or are you getting lots of questions or in, in general, are, are the maintainers okay? with the new locking types that they, they understand how preempt RT changes uh, things? I think over time we have now more understanding than we did before. And I think the document helped a lot. Um, not, not a lot of people are offended and say RT is not what we want. It makes things complicated. And that's why we try to contend it with small pieces and remain the API working as is. I mean, the set count API is an example for it where we had way more locks, uh, hacks before it, and with the rewrite, it went nicely with additional debug code with RT is abusing or using for its own benefit. And so as long as we stay hidden behind it, it's people are usually not offended. And yeah, things like red interrupts are always there. So people try to respect it. So that's not RT only thing. So that's usually what we try to, to work with. You good? Thank you very much. Thank you.